Good evening, fiends. From the depths of the deepest crypt come the Vampire Brothers of Three, Calabrese. Tonight we're talking about 13 Halloweens on the Midnight Chamber. <laughs> Thirteen Halloweens. What a fucking behemoth, behemoth of a uh, horror punk record. Maybe not the best in their library, and that by no means undermines how good it is. But at the time, I mean, it was one of the best produced, best. Uh, it had it had some of the best uh, distribution of any of the horror rock. At the like at the time, which of course uh, this was recorded in 2004, and I believe it came out the next year, 2005. No, it came out in 2004, so it was recorded early 2004 and released later that year. And uh, damn, what a fucking record! Uh, I mean, we all know Calibri as being one of the top acts in this entire scene, genre, whatever you want to call it. Um, respected all over the place, but definitely with their feet planted firmly in our like little neck of the woods. Um, so, there's a lot to cover with this record. So I'm gonna cut right now, and let's take a close up of the uh, CD and the vinyl. And then we'll be back. Boils and ghouls. Check out this freaking CD art. I feel like a lot of Calibri's artwork is really iconic in our scene. And yet again, this is another digipack. Now, note the artwork on the back of this is different from the LP. They, they changed it up classic track listing we got a trifold digi pack got all the lyrics in there the classic pinup Frankenstein girl this was that was a, a fan favorite there are a lot of tattoos out there with that image on it rest of the lyrics that, that inner sleeve tray picture put this back on here there's that Eric Boom that Calabrese logo right there is just to die for and what's what don't, what's the one thing that'll make that better? Everything bigger. Oh gosh. <laughs> Come on, this is the United States. We like everything bigger. It's almost like the CD, just extremely large until you get to the back, and then you get this nice big picture of the boys 14 years ago can't believe it's been that long super freaking good and honestly the wax like I said is is gorgeous transparent orange with that nice center label And there you go. Calibri's 13 Halloweens. Isn't that vinyl pretty? I mean, it is just, it's simple yet effective, fits packaging perfectly. I mean, right up there. So what do we know about this record? Well, we know the, uh, the cover art was done by Andrew Barr and uh, the CD, uh, art 
This nice little Halloween drawing right there was done by Eric Boom. And uh, if there's one thing you can say about Calabrese is they utilized every fucking spooky artist within like the horror and Halloween drawing realm. Like anyone who does spooky drawings, like if they were if they had a certain level of awesomeness, Calabrese utilized them. I mean, it, like, uh, Big Tony's an example. He was there from the beginning to the, uh, EP previous to this, the, the Midnight Spook Show EP. He did that. Uh, he's done various t-shirts for him. And then they moved down the line and just, they were bringing people in left and right. And then other horror punk bands were pulling from those artists. It, so, I mean, they, they really gave a lot of these guys, uh, major outlet for their work now uh, the fun fact about this record is there was a the Euro release was originally slated to have a different bit of cover art and you'll find it right here and it was done by Big Tony Rubber Wolf Graphics which is awesome but unfortunately that never happened but at least the uh, the artwork is still out there you know floating around so like I said before, this record was recorded in 2004 uh, at uh, Studio Z. I got notes here, don't mind me. Uh, there's, like I said, there's a lot to remember. Um, I'll have a link to the blogs about all this information. Um, it was really, really interesting to read. Uh, I'm glad to know the Calabrese have put together some of their own histories just so it wasn't lost. Like, I like to know about some of these bands' histories. I know other people do. That's why I do what I do here, you know? I, I, like, I, I like to bring forth where we have all come from and present it to you. But I digress. Uh, so this was engineered by Aaron Carey at Studio Z. He's not the owner. Um, I don't quite remember the owner of Studio Z's name. But it was this like little sketchy kind of uh, non, about as far away from Hollywood kind of studio as you can get. I'm talking like, like joint roaches on the floor and porno mags instead of like, you know, Rolling Stone for reading material, that kind of thing. It was a little sketchy. But uh, you gotta remember when 13 Halloweens came out, they were, they had, this was like their second time in the studio. There wasn't a lot of money behind the, the Calabrese engine. Um, they didn't have the experience to know exactly what they wanted, what was what they needed. So uh, they had got the they had their like little MP3.com style demo out floating around the internet. Aaron Carey got a hold of him, liked it. He was into a lot of the same stuff that they were into. Um, it was a good fit, and the studio was relatively cheap. So. They, you know, they checked it out, and it was like that. They were up at that studio recording. Um, and, you know, like a lot of us in the scene, the Misfits were, like, right up there in top influences. They're still one of my favorite bands. Um, they were one of Calabrese's favorite bands. And they, when they went into the studio, they wanted to have a, a, a record that had that Misfits vibe to it. Now, what do we all know about the Misfits, especially back in the late 70s and how they got that sound? It wasn't, it wasn't by choice, it was because they had shitty equipment. Um, I will rail on and on all day fucking long. In fact, I might do a, a, some classics, history and reviews, but Earth AD was recorded on a fucking four track. A four track after a show, and it, it like, it, they recorded it after an L.A. show with, uh, I believe his name is Spot, the guy who recorded Black Flags Damage. I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but they got that sound because they were using craptastical equipment. Can you imagine recording a record that millions of people were going to hear on a fucking Tascam like, cassette 4-track? Just wrap that around your head. I mean, yes, it, it does come down to the, the songs and the playing. 
Man, if you got the money, at least get a, get a fucking 8 or 16 track with some better amps. Like, damn. Anyway, the studio had some better equipment, so they just rolled with it. Um, like I said, they had really next to no experience in the studio. Uh, they'd been in the one time before to, to record the Midnight Spook, Midnight Spook Show EP. Um... Aaron didn't really want that Misfits kind of... He, he explained to them exactly what I just explained to you, how they got that pristine Misfits sound. There's a reason, you, like, shitty recordings drench everything in reverb. It covers up a lot of the mistakes. Um, it's a cool sound, don't get me wrong. I mean, if that's what you got, that's what you got. Work with it. Some of the best recordings on the planet have been, like... They, they, they've been... They worked with what they had. I mean, some really great recordings. That's dumb luck, because not everyone has the skill to make shitty sound passable. And, you know, a lot of people don't like the Misfits specifically because their recordings are shit. Well, Aaron wasn't about to have that with Calibri's. Um, so they went in and they started recording. Uh, I what they were shooting for on this record they achieved a little bit more right on point with Dago the Necros and that's four albums down the pipeline uh, we'll get to that one at some point I'm kind of going in order so essentially this was kind of a trial by fire I mean they went into the studio um, there was not a lot of formal training um, Jimmy kept blowing his vocals out doing certain parts and couldn't stay on pitch, on key, so uh, that was a learning experience. I mean, obviously they got it, we got some great takes on this, um, and Bobby had never really had anyone produce. He never had anyone tell him, well, that part might sound cooler on this, or you might want to drop that out, and he never had that, and uh, his recollections that were that he might have been maybe a little pissed. That obviously changed because having a second, you know, uh, a non-band set of ears listening to this stuff and telling you, whoa, whoa, you need to maybe change that. <clears throat> There's uh, someone, <laughs> panting, <laughs> that might need that particular uh, producer type situation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was how it kind of came to be. Uh, they rolled a TV in and a VCR and plugged the audio from the VCR straight in, and that's how you got a lot of the, uh, the movie samples that were that are on the record. I mean, it's just an all-around cool fucking situation of a, uh, a record, and it was fresh, it was new. Um, I feel they achieved sonically better things in other records, but for being like a first full length and just having all the, the, the enthusiasm and ideas just flowing, this is a hell of a first effort. I mean, like, for a first full length. And of course, you got a, a couple of the songs off of the Midnight Spook Show EP. They kind of peppered those throughout the next few releases um, with better recordings, for that matter. So, yeah. And in 04, um, you gotta think, I think Bobby was just out of high school, and Davey was still in high school. Now, Davey's always been the young pup, but, uh, so, you know, he, he was still in high school at the time, and if I, if I remember the stories correctly, they actually, they, they did this battle of the bands kind of thing, and the high school would not quite let them they would let Davey play, but they didn't want to let Jimmy or Bobby play because those two were out of high school. And Davey fought long enough to where they got to play this Battle of the Bands, but they didn't compete in the Battle of the Bands. And, I mean, how cool is that? Fucking, like, having... I mean, just the, the look and style that even they had even at 13 Halloweens. Um, taking that into your high school and just being all cool and... That's like, a, that's old, your older brother's making your dream come true kind of thing. It's super fucking awesome. Um, let's see here. Ah, so, who remembers the first four Calibri's record contests? 
the name the record contests uh, I think I, I submitted to every single one of those when they were happening um, it, it, it's such a novel and really neat idea but in this case the first one uh, nil fail storm or fail yeah fail storm he won the first contest with the name 13 Halloweens so that is super fucking neat and uh, that was how that record got named and it's it, it's fitting 13 tracks 13 Halloweens man like Calabrese just set a nice they helped set the tone for that early 2000s horror punk scene and this record was definitely part of that between this and the Midnight Spook Show EP I mean it just like 2004 I believe might have been right around it was within it was within six to eight months of when Blitz Kids Trace of a Stranger dropped I mean those are just two heavy hitters uh, in the fucking scene and the reception on 13 Halloweens was pretty fantastic. Uh, they, it garnered a lot of attention in the local Phoenix scene, because they are from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, they, they won some various, you know, punk rock awards, music awards in the, the local scene. And um, I can tell you from, like, at least the Ohio, Cincinnati, Dayton, scene because Dayton was where it was all at in 04. We, were, we hadn't really moved down to Cincinnati. That didn't happen for about another year or two. Um, we were into it. I mean, it, it like a lot of us who were uh, from the Antidote Records board message, like the Antidote Records message board and uh, like that era with Calabrese almost being on Antidote Records. They had a message board there. I mean, we were like super into it when that when this fucking record dropped. We all got it, and of course there were a few people that didn't like it, but for the most part, we all did and jumped aboard the fucking hype train that was Calibri's. Is Calibri's still to this day? Um, they were kind of they they got you know if they went from zero to being some of the cool kids in town like right off the bat. I mean, and the, you know they have the look. They they had the look then. They have the look now. Pretty pretty awesome. Um. So yeah, I mean that's Thirteen Halloweens in a nutshell. Uh, you know this came out and they played their asses off. They didn't really do any major touring until the next record came out, uh, Traveling Vampire Show. But we'll get to that one soon enough. Uh, that was when they got enough momentum. But, you know, 13 Halloween's was a good foot forward. Uh, you know, merch-wise, Calibri's has always been known. They, had, they were merch masters. I mean, everything from posters, action figures. Come on. Action figures. Calibri's freaking action figures. By the way, this is awesome. This is from a whole different era of Calibri's, but still, I mean, like I said, merch masters. So, I mean, posters, t-shirts, bandanas, patches, pens, stickers, uh, skateboards, Ouija boards, comic books. Calibri's knew how to do it. And we fucking eat that shit up. All of us ate that shit up. So, uh... That was only just getting started at 13 Halloweens. They were selling the records. Um, probably some t-shirts and patches. I know I've got a few things from that era. Um, but man, they were just killing it and they knew what they were doing. And man, you better get ready because at the recording of this video, they have just stopped, they have just finished demoing their seventh record and are getting ready to hit the actual studio to record it. I'm fucking excited. I don't want to get off on a tangent again. Uh, now, for the collectors out there, because I know some of you do want to know, uh, the pressings on these, there were uh, the vinyl here, there were 500 on transparent orange wax. And uh, I, I talked to Davey about this, and like they just printed thousands of CDs, so I don't think it's going to be like overly hard to get a hold of. 
uh, probably with as much hype as those boys have gotten between here and Europe and just all over the place, I mean, they're, I'd say probably between purely guesstimation, three and 10,000. And that, that's conjecture on my part. I do not know. Um, they were, they were definitely one of the larger horror rock bands, but not big enough to, I mean, they've only had their own label. So, you know, they had to rein it in within their own means. So if I were to guess, I'd say between three and 10, which is a hell of a sizable gap. But I mean, the album's not hard to find. Could be less than that, but it, like they still sell it, and I'll put links to where you can get it in the description. Um, the vinyl is still available, so get that too. Um, they're having, they're always having sales at their merch store. Um, so yeah, get that. Um, this is just one hell of a macabre trip. Uh, if I had to, I don't know if I can even pick some favorites off of this. Um, I will say one of my favorite Calvary songs in general, just across the board, is Eyes Down. I love that tune. Um, I, it, it's funny that the, when they recorded this, they thought Phantasmagoria was going to be like the single from this. And it has a lot of fans out there for sure but it's not the uh, like the quintessential track off of this I mean they did a re-record of Midnight Spook Show which is always a, a fucking great tune um, Death of Me Resur Resurrection is one of my favorite songs off this album uh, honestly the album is no filler from head to toe I mean all 13 tracks are fucking killer um, every day's a funeral. Every day's a funeral. So fucking good. About makes you want to woe you right out of your fucking socks just putting this on. Uh, and another thing to note, which you know, I I said this before when I was covering just the look, the actual CDs, but or the uh, the releases in the close up, but the the rear covers are different on these. super fucking cool release but hey i'm rambling um there's a bit of your history lesson on this record um oh you know if i might interject something from when they were recording this they have a lot of young bands and i i've been through this because i've recorded too y you get bored especially when they're the uh, when it's all digital and people are editing and you're not involved in the editing or <laughs> you're mixing and you're not hands-on with the mixing the guys were bored that this was their since this was their first bowling they didn't know what they were doing so they were really really bored uh, they are a little more hands-on these days they, they kind of get in there and you know they've, they've got ideas they just wanted this shit on tape or in this case, CD, um, when they recorded this one, and they got they they got a hell of a uh, a hell of a like little uh, you know packet of art out of all of this. It's just fantastic. So you know, get out there, go sit in a cemetery, listen to some fucking Calibries, take your girl, you know, pop on backseat of the hearse. Uh, there are a lot of anthems that definitely had that a lot of us lived by in this you know fucking killer so yeah Calibri's 13 Halloween's get out there check it out buy it get the get the get the give the guys some money to get that seventh record out and I'll see you next time on the midnight chamber